Thank you for taking the time for your busy day to uh, attend another webinar. I know we are all doing a lot of this. Um, I'm Nathan, I'm president of ComWest. Uh, Tiffany is our technology consultant. Thomas is our one of our engineers. Um, Tara is doing all the off screen coordination, keeping everything working. Um, if you have chats, please chat, um, just chat to Nathan and uh, we'll go through uh, Q&A at the end and try and answer questions for everybody. Um, the spooky monster theme is in honor of Halloween and uh, October by the uh, Department of Homeland Security has been declared to be uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I think it's awareness. So it just went to sleep. <laughs> just a second. Um, and we wanted to, uh, with Cybersecurity Month, we wanted to highlight some of the things that are going on um, to help you better manage your business and your employees. Um, obviously, this is a big topic and there's no way that we can handle every possible aspect in just a single meeting or probably even in a month of meetings. Um, but we're going to review some of the most critical areas, um, provide some options and suggestions on how to help you, uh, help you manage your employees, manage your business, and protect your data. Um, as we review the information, just please write your uh, questions in chat uh, to me and uh, we'll read them off in the Q&A at the end. Um, currently, uh, they're reporting that there is a cyber attack every 39 seconds. Um, between July and August of 2020, the average number of weekly cyber attacks for educational facilities rose by 30%. Uh, went up to 608 attacks a week. Um, prior, it had been 368 average in a two month period before, uh, according to Checkpoint. The number of new malicious files processed by Kaspersky Labs or Kaspersky Labs in lab detection technologies, uh, they're a big antivirus company, uh, reached 360,000 a day, and that was in 2017. We haven't even seen a stat for 2020 yet. Um, and that was an 11.5% increase over the previous year. Um, ABC describes the stars of their hit show Shark Tank as tough, self-made, multimillionaire and billionaire tycoons. But that doesn't mean that they can't be duped. Barbara Cochran, one of the judges on the show who decides whether to invest in the dreams of various entrepreneurs was robbed of close to $400,000 by a business, uh, BEC, a business email compromise in February of 2020. Uh, Cochran, who made her millions as a real estate broker, um, said her bookkeeper wired money as instructed in an email to someone posing as an assistant, ostensibly to pay for a real estate renovation. After the money was sent, Cochran found that the email address was not actually that of the assistant. It was one letter off from the real address. Uh, there's no re there was no reason to be suspicious as they invest in a lot of real estate, Cochran reported to People Magazine. Although Cochran is one of the business email compromise's highest profile victims, the attacks followed a playbook that has become all too routine. Uh, average in 2019 for data breaches cost to a business was 300, I'm sorry, $3.92 million. Um, for small businesses, it was reported in 2017 that the average cost was $117,000. And that's not just lost revenue from sales, it's lost productivity from employees, it's the recovery of damage costs, um, and just the general impact to your reputation and everything. Um, obviously, those numbers in 2020 are gonna be a lot higher because there's just been a huge increase in all this. A recent study showed that there are almost 30,000 spoofing attacks each day, plus 77% of the Fortune 500 companies do not have DMARC policy set up, making it easy for a scammer to spoof their brands in a phishing attack. That means there are companies there are the company cyber criminals will use to try and trick you, changing passwords, late payments, and things like that. So what we're saying there is like Microsoft, people will spoof Microsoft, Google, Chase, Capital One, all these different agencies using their logos and stuff to try and trick you into giving them um, some of your critical information. And yes, Macs can be attacked too. Uh, it used to be that Macs were kind of exempt from some of this, but the uh, hackers have figured out that people with Macs think that they're uh, 
they're protected and they're invulnerable to all this and actually Macs are being targeted almost more than the Windows machines now. Okay, so we're gonna start with the big one um, with types of email attacks. Um, we use email every day. Cybercrime costs 3.5 billion in losses in 2019 alone with business email compromise, also known as BEC, causing the most damages. That doesn't include unreported losses, which are significant. IC3 received almost half a million complaints last year, more than 1,300 a day, with phishing being responsible for 93% of email breaches. There can be a variety of indirect and intangible costs from attacks too, such as large legal fees, regulatory fines, oper operational dis disruptions, a damaged brand reputation, and other severe consequences. As you can see, there's a long list of different kinds of email attacks and we'll be covering a few of the most common ones during this webinar. So a few quick facts first, um, on average, just 61% of people can identify the de definition of phishing from a multiple choice array. 32% of breaches involve phishing. 75% of cyber attacks start with an email. Ransomware is found in 27% of mal malware incidents, up from 24% in 2019. 18% of organizations have reported a ransomware attack, and 41% of customers would stop buying from a business that has been victim of a ransomware attack. Um, obviously, you, you're losing faith um, and trust with your customers if you can't keep your security in check. So the first type of email attack we're going to talk about is spam. Uh, spam is an unsolicited bulk email message, also known as junk email. Spammers typically send an email to millions of addressees with the expectation that only a small number will respond to the message. Spammers gather email addresses from a variety of sources, including using software to harvest from online address books. The collected email addresses are also often spent, sold to other spammers. Spam comes in various forms. Some spam emails push scams. Others are used to conduct email fraud. Spam also comes from in the form of phishing emails that are brand impersonation to trick users into revealing personal information, such as login credentials and credit card details. Nate mentioned that earlier with using the logos to spoof um, the, the businesses and making, making it look like emails come from that business. Uh, spam accounts for 53% of the world's email traffic and about 20 billion per year in losses. And then we'll go through a few examples of what email spam can look like in the next slides. So this first example here, um, it actually identi identifies itself as spam which can be pretty sneaky. Um, some people might be inclined to actually click on this because, you know, oh, it's identified itself as spam. It kind of looks like something I might have might have inquired about. But you click on those and, and you can be a target. This one here, um, odd grammar, that's a telltale sign of spam, um, you know, using some of these weird phrases and things like that. Dear sir, that's kind of a telltale sign as well. Um, and your bank would never email you about this type of error. If they are, you might want to reconsider your bank. In this example, the sender's email looks legitimate and the large request for money may cause alarm for some to immediately reply with account details. Call your bank directly or log into the website separately to see if anything seems off. Never go directly from a link that they send. With this one, um, some attacks might not be as obvious, but they can be if you really look. In this example, you can see the attack comes from a spoofed email address that you could easily overlook. Notice the replacement of the L with a number one in the sender's email. What can you do about it? <clears throat> uh, the primary thing is spam filters. Um, this is a software that lives out on your email server um, and it filters the most obvious messages before it even gets into your inbox. Um, 
it can also be told, you know, this is a spam message they got through next time, please, uh, please stop this. And that can be based on content. Um, like Tiffany mentioned, the uh, replacement of characters in email addresses, things of that nature. And you can also block a given sender or a given domain. You know, we all get on those email lists from even vendors that we purchase something from and you can't get off of it. Um, your spam filter can actually be told, don't let this message through next time. Uh, the second thing that you can do is employee training. Um, that's a huge hot button right now. Um, spam filters are not perfect. They never will be. Um, and if you try to tighten it down so that it catches all of the spam, then you're going to start catching legitimate emails as well. Um, so employee training is key to uh, identify the messages that do get through and then uh, delete them without uh, opening the message, downloading attachments, clicking on links, things of that nature. Okay, so this handout, um, this will be provided to you in reference for your training purposes so that your employees can recognize common email red flags. It's a really handy uh, handout, you know, just kind of says what to look out for um, from senders, um, some of the hyperlinks to look out for, and the content and attachments. Um, it, it'll help your employees out a lot with, with recognizing things that could be spam or malicious attacks. So malware is another common type of email attack. You've undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly heard of malware, but do you know what it does and how it exploits weakness? Cyber criminals use email to deliver documents containing malicious software, also known as malware. Typically, either the malware is hidden directly in the document itself or an embedded script downloads it from the external website. Common types of malware include viruses, trojans, spyware, worms, and ransomware. So let's cover some examples of malware. The first being volumetric malware. This type of malware is designed to be spread in a group and takes advantage of older unpatched systems using common vulnerabilities. It exploits known vulner vulnerabilities and generally can be caught by signatures and fact finding. Volumetric mal malware is known as commodity malware and viruses. Another example is zero-day malware. Advanced malware attacks use zero-day threats, which are ones that haven't been seen before and don't match any known malware signatures. They may exploit a previously unknown software vulnerability or use new malware, a new malware variant delivered by standard means. These zero-day attacks are impossible to detect with traditional signature-based solutions. All right, some solutions for these. Um, first is antivirus. And um, in this uh, case, there's actually two different kinds of antivirus. One that lives on the workstation and scans messages once they've been received. One lives on the server. Um, both of those can come in two types. One is uh, signature matching that Tiffany mentioned. And those look at files that are known vulnerabilities. There's a unique signature associated with that file. It, uh, the antivirus creates that signature, compares it to a known database. If it matches, then it is rejected. If it doesn't match, it's allowed through. Um, you also have um, artificial intelligence or heuristics, depending on which terminology you prefer to use. And that actually runs the file in a sandbox environment and looks at the behavior. What is this file doing? Is it sending data? Is it downloading data? This does actually help to protect against those zero day threats because it's looking at behavior as opposed to a specific file. Um, the other thing is employee training. Again, you need to, need to be able to identify uh, suspicious documents, suspicious files, um, never, unless you're expecting it specifically, download a zip file. Those are used commonly to hide that uh, malicious content in an email message. Um, and then also uh, Word, Excel documents, things of that nature that have macros, which is a code that lives inside the Word document. Uh, those can cause just as much damage as anything else. <clears throat> Uh, another tactic that's used is spear phishing. Um, spear phishing is a highly personalized form of email phishing attack. Cyber criminals research their targets and craft carefully designed messages, often impersonating a trusted colleague, website, or a business. Spear phishing emails typically try to steal sensitive information, such as your logins or your financial uh, details. 
which it then used to commit fraud, identity theft, and other crimes. Cyber criminals also take advantage of social engineering tactics in their spear phishing attacks, including urgency. I'm sure we've all seen the emails with, you gotta deal with this right now, like social security number's been hacked. Um, brevity, you know, just very short risk emails. Um, pressure, and, um, and just they use those to increase the likelihood of success and get more people to jump on it. Um, one tactic that they use is called a tracking pixel. Um, and it's a tiny little image at just one pixel by one pixel. It's indiscernible to the eye and it lives on the website. So when you click the link, it goes to the website. So when the um, application requests the image, the sender who controls the site receives confirmation that the message was opened as well as the IP address of where it was received, um, which tells them what part of the country or world you're in, the time when the email was opened and information about the program that was used to open it. Um, so they'll know if you're using Outlook, if you're using an iPhone, if you're using Android uh, or Gmail. Um, have you ever noticed email client, have you ever noticed your email client does not display images until you click a link to download them? That's not to boost performance or limit traffic. Um, that's actually a safeguard so that every time you open an email, if it is a malicious one, it doesn't automatically open that and subject you to those type of threats. Um, here's one scenario. Uh, while traveling abroad, you get a message in your work box that looks relevant to your business. As soon as you realize it's just an unwanted solicitation, you close it and trash it. But in the meantime, the attacker has learned you are in another country, judging by your IP address. That means personal contact with coworkers is difficult. Thus, you may be a safe person to in in imitate. Um, you're using an iPhone. You open the message with mail from iOS. So adding a sent from my iPhone signature on the email that they send um, will make it look more credible. Um, and you read the email at 11 a.m. That alone is not important, but if you click messages regularly, the cyber criminals will be able to figure out your schedule and time um, an attack to coincide with the period when you tend to be unavailable. Protecting yourself from traffic, from tracking is very difficult. Um, but that doesn't mean that you should circumvent these, uh, these steps that are already in place with your email client. Um, if your email client prompts you to click here to download pictures, make sure that you think about it, look at the message and determine if you really do need to see those pictures. If it's a sales email from Walmart, we don't really care. Probably we're not going to buy that stuff anyways. Um, if it's something from a customer or something like that, just like I said, just think about it before you move on. Um, if you uh, see a message in your spam, make sure that you look at it before you even open it in the preview pane. Um, look at the sender's name, look at the subject, make sure that it at least at a cursory glance appears legitimate. Um, modern spam filters are typically very accurate, especially if it's a customer or a uh, colleague or somebody, they're typically not gonna end up there. Um, also be very careful with business to business mass mailings. Um, if, if it's a company that you've specifically signed up for, uh, chances are you'll be just fine. But if you start getting uh, cold calls, cold emails from a business, then there may be something else going on there. Um, and also use robust antivirus, anti-spam, um, anti-phishing technologies, uh, both on your workstation and on the server side of your email to uh, help protect yourself. Uh, let's talk about some more complex um, attacks. Sorry, payroll scammers, um, pay or payroll scams are uh, popular for business email compromise attacks. Um, these scams target human resources and payroll departments with the goal of getting an employee's salary transferred to a different fraudulent account. Hackers impersonate employees providing new account details for the um, paycheck deposit. Um, payroll scams account for about 8% of the business email compromise attacks, um, but they're on the rise, uh, growing to more than 800% recently, or by 800% recently. Um, Gmail accounts um, are used to launch about 47% of these. Um, because a lot of employees use Gmail, or a lot of us use Gmail for our personal accounts. Um, and it's a little bit, looks more um, credible. You know, email coming from my, what looks like my Gmail account to the HR person to say, hey, change my direct deposit to this account, things like that. 
Um, EAC is email account compromise and BEC is business email compromise. They're both very similar, uh, used to gain control of your accounts or to get um, someone to do something fraudulent. Um, and by through 2023, they're estimating that the BEC attacks will continue to double each year to over $5 billion and lead to large financial losses for enterprises. In BEC scams, the attacker pretends to be someone the victim trusts. It's usually with an email address dis disguised to look like it belongs to the trusted person, typically a boss, a coworker, a vendor, or a business partner. Um, here are the few of the techniques that attackers use to disguise um, themselves as trusted senders. Uh, domain spoofing. Um, the attacker forges the sender's address, um, the from address, and using a trusted domain. The recipient sees the forged address rather than the sender's actual uh, domain. I got one just yesterday. Um, it says it was from my email system, or my voicemail system, um, which was not uh, even close to the right email address and stuff. Um, but I opened it on my computer. I didn't open it. I saw the email. And um, it wanted me to click to play the message. But when you looked at the details, you could see that it was from a completely fraudulent email address. But in the title, they said it was from Commerce Court um, Mail. So again, you just got to watch all of that. Um, Look-alike domains. Uh, to get around domain spoofing, attackers often register a domain that re resembles the one that they're trying to impersonate. The domain might use the um, number zero instead of the letter O, or on that earlier example, use a one instead of an L to make it look legit. Um, but unless you really look at it, you'd probably never catch it. Uh, display name spoofing, um, that's what this attack was. Um, they said it was from so-and-so, but if you looked at the actual email address, um, you can see it was not anything close to that, um, but the sender can put whatever name they want to in there. And if you just glance over it and see it, especially if you're doing it from your cell phone, not from your computer where you don't see as much detail, um, it's very easy to click on that and then you're in trouble. Um, using that phony identity, the attacker tries, uh, tricks the victim into wiring money, changing payment account details, or some of the other uh, financial fraud. Other techniques to get users to open and act on requests in emails include using branded elements such as a company's display name, logo, um, an overall look and feel, and an urgent language, um, clickbait subject lines, and content marketing marked uh, confidential. Um, examples of those, you've probably all seen them. You get it from your bank, you get it from your credit card, um, you get it from some of your vendors. Hey, your password is expired, you need to update it. Um, you know, we need your account information to complete this. Um, and they're using logos like from Chase or Microsoft and things like that to try and trick you into actually giving them the detail and making it look um, very legit. And a lot of times they make them look very legit. <laughs> so, um, because of their targeted nature, use of social engineering and lack of malicious payload detecting and stopping these complex and evasive attacks is difficult at times and, and can be time consuming. Um, EAC closely resembles BEC, but it uses identity deception with a twist. In some ways, EAC is even harder to detect and stop than BEC. In the EAC attack, the attacker takes over the trusted email account. So this is where somebody's um, been able to get into your actually, your login to your email. Um, so they actually have control of your email. Um, the email account doesn't just seem legit because it really is legit. Um, the EAC leaves two victims, the person whose account is compromised and the email recipient who falls for a request for that account. Having control over a trusted account gives the attacker a trove of information to take the impersonation that much, make the interpretation that much more effective. They have their contacts, their calendar appointments, old emails, et cetera. <coughs> Excuse me. Considering a cyber attack, considering a cyber attack proof point threat researchers encountered last year. Attackers had breached a, a Gmail account and were se seeking out more victims. They didn't need to look far. Like most of us, the compromised user had unfinished emails sitting in their draft folder. The attacker found the draft that looked nearly complete, uh, attached malware to it, and hit send. The hijacked message was timely and relevant. It came from a legitimate email address and someone the recipient knew or was expecting emails from. Um, and it was written in, uh, uh, in the unwitting sender's own voice and tone, not the awkward things where dear sir and things like that that we see. It was no longer, it's no wonder that those attacks are so effective. 
here's how attackers usually compromise legitimate email accounts or get into accounts. They can do brute force attacks. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, breach replay attacks, phishing that we've talked about, and malware attacks. Once they have control of an email account, EAC attackers can launch, attackers can launch a variety of attacks, such as think of EAC as the ultimate impersonation tactic. In EAC, attackers hijack an email account to essentially become that person it belongs to, and they bypass many email authentication controls because they're actually um, using legitimate accounts. Um, so, yeah. Um, this is just kind of a breakout, a little bit of the differences. Um, with BEC, they're emulating an account, making it look like an account. The EAC, they're actually using a legitimate account. So um, again, just some things to be aware of and to talk to your employees with. Um, part of that red flag um, thing that uh, Tiffany talked about kind of just points out some examples and some of the safeguards and things to watch on that. Uh, email security, a strong spam filter, antivirus, and uh, restricting emails that appear to come from your organization but actually originate from outside of your organization um, are all things that can be done to help uh, prevent these. Authentication, making sure that you have strong passwords on your email accounts and two-factor authentication where possible. Um, two-factor authentication requires that you have uh, two things, something you know, your username and password, and something you have that would be access to your cell phone um, to allow you to log into that account. Um, something else you can do is use cloud applications. It's a little counterintuitive, but cloud applications typically have stronger security controls than internal applications because they do face the outside world. You can get into them from elsewhere. Um, so they have things that uh, help to prevent other people from signing into that account without being completely accurate. Um, Things like uh, account lockouts. If you try a bad password five times, you get locked out. Um, they also do more advanced things. Look at source addresses. Make sure that you're logging in from where you typically do. Um, internally, inside your business, restrict web access. A lot of these uh, attacks rely on um, having access to an external website to, uh, to execute the attack. And by restricting web access to only uh, applications, websites um, that you actually need for your business, you can really help to reduce uh, the effectiveness of these attacks. Um, also control content. Um, we're looking at things like online shopping, um, you know, online gambling and other nefarious uses of the internet. Um, the more nefarious the use, the more likely it is that there's something out there that you shouldn't be doing and that can get you on the list um, to be uh, a victim. Um, visibility, know what's going on in your network. Use tools that an analyze logs um, and then provide actionable alerts. And that last one is key. You can look at them all you want. You can have software that looks at them all you want. But if you're getting hundreds or thousands of alerts a day, that doesn't do you any good. Most of those are gonna be false positives or things that you can't do anything about. But if you can get that down to two or three alerts a day and actually have something that you can do about them, that becomes a very effective uh, method of slowing these attacks down. Um, the other thing is automated remediation. Having an automated system that can react to those alerts and then notify you of an action taken. Um, what that does is it removes the human element one step farther. Uh, if the system sees something that it doesn't think is accurate, then it takes action to stop it. Um, and then the key is also notifying you so that you can address it internally, you know, with the employee or, you know, block an email address or depending on the situation, those actions take uh, different forms, but you need to know about it so you can further correct it. And then again, I'm starting to sound like a stuck record here, but education, you need to train your users to identify fake sites, um, password safety, using different passwords for different sites, not reusing passwords, um, all of those kind of things. Okay, so with that, we'll move into hacking. Um, there's no, there's so much more with email, but we'll we'll move along. Um, when it comes to poaching data, hackers tend to focus on easy prey, which would be small businesses. 
Why? Because they often lack strong security measures and standards, likely due to leaner teams. And many hats, most small business owners don't make it a priority to A, regularly monitor server networks and data, B, invest in an IT specialist, <laughs> C, <laughs> ensure that they only operate on secure Wi Fi, and lastly, um, learn about and train employees on cybersecurity best practices. This may seem understandable since many small business owners have a lot on their plate and tend to assume that getting hacked just won't happen to them. But helping and ensure data security is essential for small businesses. Most simply can't afford to absorb the astronomical cost of a data breach in the way that a large, large enterprise or company like Target can. In fact, it's reported that 60% of small businesses that suffer data theft close the doors within six months. Um, another attack that they use is the brute force, brute force attack. Um, cyber criminals will try to uh, different tactics to capture users' login or account credentials, but one popular method is the old reliable brute force attack. With this attack, a hacker uses an easily available cracking tool to run through a large number of password combinations until they get the right one. Um, so this would be like getting into your email and they just run this computer program that pumps hundreds of thousands of password combinations until they find something that works. Um, brute, force, brute force attacks are a common technique at any time. However, new posts from the business VPN provider NordVPN teams discussed how these attacks have targeted certain accounts lately and, have, and how organizations can better protect themselves. Um, brute force attacks typically are aimed at computers and other devices on networks to capture email addresses, passwords or passphrases, usernames and pins. Such attacks exploit weak or otherwise vulnerable passwords that are easy to guess. Um, looking for signs, if someone is repeatedly and unsuccessfully trying to log into a certain account, um, that's a tip off that somebody's trying to hack that uh, particular account. Um, Titan security organizations to improve security um, by setting up the two-factor or multi-factor authentication that Thomas talked about, um, putting their websites behind a web application firewall, and installing a VPN gateway to secure any RDP connections, which would be remote desktop connections. If you've got people working from home, controlling a machine back at the office. Um, catching an attack in progress um, and neutralizing it um, is your best bet. Um, once an attacker has access to your network, uh, they're more difficult to catch. Um, after you discover the attack, um, you can then block or blacklist that IP address to prevent additional attacks from the same sources. Um, passwords are important. 16% um, of those surveyed use the same one or two passwords for all of their accounts. And we all struggle with that. Um, there are tools out there to keep track of your passwords. Um, we can help you with that if you've got questions. Um, but keeping them strong and never giving them out is the most critical thing. According to the FBI, length of complexity is the big thing. Require everyone to use longer passwords or passphrases. And this is the FBI saying 15 or more characters without requiring uppercase, lowercase, or special characters. Only require password changes when there is a reason to believe your network has been compromised. Um, have your network administrator, administrator screen everyone's passwords against lists of dictionary words and passwords known to have been compromised, like one, two, three, four, zero, 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 <laughs> password. Um, uh, to help prevent the denial of service attack against your email service, don't block a user's account for a certain number of incorrect login attempts. That way, even if um, an adverse adver adversary floods your network with, a, a, with purposeful incorrect login information, your users can be locked, won't be locked out of their own account. Um, and, don't allow password hints. <coughs> okay, so QR codes. Um, adoption is soaring this year as every business pursues touchless selling service and customer experience strategies to protect their customers' employees during the pandemic. QR-based coupon codes are among the fastest growing that vectors, uh, growing threat vectors globally with 5.3 billion codes predicted to be redeemed by 2020. Mobile devices and everyone's identity doubling as digital lifeline to family, friends, jobs, social media, and financial accounts. 
At the same time, employees are using mobile devices and in many cases, their own unsecured devices more than ever to connect with others, interact with a variety of cloud-based applications and services, and stay productive as they work from anywhere. Many employees are also using their mobile devices to scan QR codes in their everyday lives, putting themselves and enterprise resources at risk. So be careful connecting from unsecure networks. While waiting for a client at your local coffee shop, it's tempting to hop on the free Wi-Fi and get some work done. But be wary, hackers often set up on Wi-Fi hotspots, giving them sneaky names similar to where they are. For example, Pete's Coffee Guest. When unwitting Wi-Fi users join these poser networks, hackers can easily gain access to their devices. And even if you do land on the right network, pub public Wi-Fi offers little to no real security from savvy hackers. So 45% of US workers believe that trusted locations always offer safe public net Wi-Fi networks. Only 31% have changed the default password on their Wi-Fi router, and just 19% have checked and or updated their Wi-Fi router's firmware. So your remote workers need basic training. 32% of those surveyed don't know what a VPN is. So we need to ensure home networks are robust with business grade equipment. Privacy is always a concern. Who knows what other devices are connected to your router? Be aware of risks of sharing devices like kids using your work computer for school. Train employees on how to properly access the company server, shared files, and everything else on your network. Make sure VPN and remote connections are set up and used correctly and stay up to date on new tech and ever-changing threats like consent phishing. BYOD, bring your own device. What, where, why, and how? Um, question for you, what devices are you allowing on your network? Um, are you allowing employees to use their own tablets, cell phones, laptops? Uh, especially if they're working remote or working from home. Um, uh, where have those devices been used? Where have they been connected? Like Tiffany was talking about before, if, you know, they've been in Starbucks, they've been in different places, hotels, uh, using different Wi-Fi things. Um, you know, what possible uh, opportunities have those had to be hacked? Um, and how are you monitoring securing those devices? Those are things you need to be concerned about and be aware of. Um, and do you require um, antivirus on those employees' devices, whether they are required to provide their own or you're providing company antivirus um, for them? Um, you need to have policies and procedures in place uh, using their device for them using their devices. Um, you need to look into mobile device manager um, that can be used to wipe a device that was lost or stolen and remove any and all information that could be compromised. Um, so if somebody's I have my cell phone, somebody's using their cell phone for work, his cell phone for work, uh, and uh, he loses it, he set it down, somebody picked it up at the airport, whatever, it's gone, we'll never see it again. Um, with the mobile device manager, you can actually tell it to wipe it next time it comes online, um, and it will take everything off of that. Now, hopefully the next day he doesn't find it under the seat of his car because um, it's been wiped, but you're safe. And that's the big thing. That's what we're talking about is safety for your network. Because if he's got logins and stuff on there, he's got his password saved um, and things that people can get into that, then they can get into your stuff. Um, and do you block, Thomas talked about this earlier, do you block certain types of sites or activities on your business network through your firewall? Um, you can set up um, you know, restrictions keeping people from doing all the online shopping and fantasy football and all those things that we all like so much. Um, this is just a kind of a picture, um, give you an idea. All of those dots are actual potential threat locations um, that people could be, um, that people could access your business network from. Um, if you've got your employees out on public um, spaces, airports, restaurants and things, um, employees working from home with a private network um, within your own company, um, and then within your, um, you know, just your general clients and things like that. Those are all things you need to take in consideration when you're thinking about protecting your data. Um, let's talk about um, some security strategies. Um, hopefully we've scared you at least a little bit. Um, that was our goal. Um, we need to scare you into doing some action. Um, let's talk about the solution to cyber or some of the solutions to cybersecurity. Uh, number one, we keep bringing it up, and in today's world, it is 
really true, but training employees um, and security principles. Um, your employees need to be aware um, that there's these things going on. You know, if they get emails saying, we need to reset your password, click here, um, they shouldn't do that. You know, if it's your Microsoft Outlook, call your um, IT manager, see if you need to set your password. You know, if it's your credit card or your bank, don't click on the link, go directly to the website um, and check your stuff there or call your bank. Um, you need to protect your information, your computers, your networks from cyber attacks um, with some of the things we've talked about and other things that are out there. Uh, firewall security for your internet connections. Um, come up with a mobile device action plan. Um, what's the policy? Um, if an employee is using their personal device and they lose it or their kid drops it in the pool or what's the policy? When or how much time are they supposed to before they need to notify you that some, there's been an event and things so you can take action. Um, make backup copies of important business data and information. You know, obviously the cloud, um, there's different tools and resources and ways to do that. Um, control physical access to your computers and create user accounts for each employee. Um, this is critical. Um, you think your employees, you trust them, you love them, they're great, they've been with you forever. Um, that's fine. But if you're not having your um, employees lock their computers when they walk away or have them time out and lock screens and things, uh, maybe they got some friends in um, and they went down the hall to get something to drink and the friend's sitting there playing on your work computer. Um, you know, who knows what they're doing. Um, so you need to do that. Secure your Wi-Fi networks. Um, we've talked about that before. You don't want to use the default um, settings and things that come with it. Your IT manager needs to set up um, security for you with your Wi-Fi. Um, and employ the best practices on payment cards. Um, how you're paying things and things, you need to review that process. If you're paying bills online and stuff, you need to review that process. You need to make sure you're locked down and protected. Um, and then and limit employees' access to data and information. Um, you know, limit authority to install software. Uh, we can block machines so that people can't just bring in some new, hey, I got this great program, let's slow down your computer and see what it does. And it's now on your network and it's now in everything that you've got and you, you know, you spend two days trying to figure out who loaded what and then you try and figure out how you're gonna fix it. So, you know, you can restrict what people can do either just in policy or physically we can keep people from loading things on, on machines unless you authorize it. So let's be proactive. Um, the goal of antivirus as a solution, also known as AAAS, is prevention. Antivirus is a simple way to help protect your hardware and information. Antivirus software is intended to detect a threat to your computer and remove it before it causes damage to your network and sensitive information. So a couple differences, um, there's business grade, um, antivirus, which monitors business, work from home devices to eliminate potential threats. The way it works is the software scans each file, program, or application on your device, then compares the item to a specific list of known threats stored in its database if determined to be similar to any code on the list. The item is quarantined or removed. An alert will be sent to the management system, by the management system, to your IT team. It's recommended for all businesses with employees using work and or personal computers for business use and any additional devices connected to the network. Artificial intelligence, uh, it's more of a proactive monitoring and learn, it learns from the user's patterns to detect potential threats. The way it works is the algorithm learns um, from the past to infer the future. It, it quickly and accurately identifies what is benign and what is a threat. This antivirus operation option prevents malicious code from ever being executed on a targeted system. And it's recommended for any businesses in the medical and financial industry, any with um, international connections, PCI compliance concerns, security conscious um, or strong sensitive personal information. Another piece on that too, uh, you may think you're using business grade antivirus, but if it's free, it's probably not the business grade stuff that you need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, another uh, tool, Thomas has referred to it before, uh, two-party authentication or multi-factor authentication is something you can set up. If somehow somebody is able to get your Microsoft Office 365 email login, um, if you're using two-party authentication, um, they can't even do anything with it even if they do get your password because for somebody to get in, they have to have the second step. 
Um, some of you may already be doing that with Gmail. Uh, when you log into Gmail, it sends um, something to your cell phone and says, are you trying to log in? You know, yes, no, or put a pin, pin in um, and things. But this, um, in short, it requires two actions to log in instead of just putting a password in. So um, like Thomas said, this, you know, the second part is something that you have um, separate, um, you know, whether it calls you, whether it texts you or different ways that way. Um, and again, even with this, uh, or with this, if somebody does get your password, um, then they still can't get in. Um, you can do that with financial institutions, um, obviously email, um, some of your other cloud apps and things, this would be something to consider just as an additional safety precaution. Um, so, and even if you were trying to access one of your cloud accounts from an airport and somebody was hacking that and got your password, if you're using two-party, they'd still never be able to get in because the second action is offline completely and they would never see that. So they still wouldn't be able to do anything. Um, patch management, were you doing that? Or me? I guess I was, no, well, that's fine. Go ahead and talk about patch management. Um, <laughs> patch, <laughs> patch management um, is one of the single most important proactive actions that you can take. Um, every time Microsoft pushes patches, Adobe, um, you see them all the time. They're always nagging you to reboot your computer, install this, you know, reboot to finish. Um, every one of those patches is being pushed out by that company because there was a vulnerability that was discovered. Um, in the past year, 57% of the uh, confirmed breaches started with a uh, patch that was not applied for a known vulnerability. Um, patch was available, somebody just hadn't rebooted or somebody hadn't said, yes, no, I want to finish this installation. Um, once these flaws become known, the companies are required to publish the details of the flaw with the patch. At that point, the uh, attacker has all of the same technical information that the manufacturer does, and they can use that to find a way to exploit that vulnerability. Um, all you need to do is reboot your computer when you get that notification. Now you're protected against that particular attack. Um, something related to this um, earlier in the presentation, Tiffany referred to zero day attacks. Um, zero day attacks are the exception to that. <coughs> A zero day attack is the first instance of the attack. Every attack at some point starts out as a zero day, but it's only a zero day once. Once it's a zero day, the company then takes that attack, reverse engineers that, and then builds a patch for it so that you're protected. Um, again, reboot your computer when it when you're prompted to it. It really is that important. Well, that's one of the reasons too that it was so critical to get rid of the Windows 7 machines because Microsoft quit making the patches. Um, so those machines are left open as hackers find opportunities to get in there and things. So um, to be protected, you don't want Windows 7 machines on your network or even using them at home. So. Um, web filtering and DNS. Um, typically, this is integrated in with your firewall. Um, your firewall is a device that sits on the edge of your network um, and protects you from the outside world. Um, think of it on the front as the front door of your house. You know, you walk in, only somebody that has the key can get in. You close it behind you, um, and then you're uh, protected. Uh, web filtering is often done at the firewall. Um, it looks at uh, uh, web content based on a pre-categorized database, um, keywords, domain names, and things like that. Um, another type is using DNS. DNS is essentially the phone book of the internet. It takes a website name, facebook.com, and it converts it to an internet IP address. Um, DNS web content filtering looks only at the domain name, so and then compares it to, again, a pre-categorized database. Um, if you were to take Facebook as an example, um, you would send a request to facebook.com that would go to your DNS. Your DNS would say, you know, this is categorized as a social media. Um, but for this user, we've, uh, there's been a policy put in place that uh, you can't use social media on your computer. Um, it would then return a different address than actual Facebook that would bring you to a splash page that says, hey, you've been blocked because this doesn't meet your company's policy. A um, couple of things to keep in mind with limiting website access. Um, it does have the potential to improve employee productivity. We've all seen the uh, receptionist when you walk into a business that couldn't be bothered that there's a new customer sitting at the counter and she's 
you know, sitting there on our phone, scrolling Facebook, choosing to ignore you. Um, it also reduces your attack surface. Like we had talked about earlier, many, many web, uh, uh, antivirus or virus attacks, excuse me, rely on some sort of outside influence, either to download content and things of that nature. Um, by limiting web access based on category, you can avoid a lot of those. The other thing to keep in mind is that this needs to be done with your business needs in mind. Um, all businesses, even departments, have different needs and uses for the internet. Um, for example, your, your sales and marketing team may need access to social media so that they can push those ad campaigns, respond to those ad campaigns. But your uh, IT department, for example, may not. You know, they're not, they don't have any use for social media, so it's safe to block that for them. So just keep that in mind um, and that uh, there is no one size fits all for these types of solutions. Um, internal vulnerabilities are um, responsible for 70% of all data breaches in small and medium sized businesses. Um, those are, again, internal vulner vulnerabilities. Um, first of all, it's employees. Um, second of all would be unprotected machines or devices, uh, not having antivirus um, and things. Also not um, having email filtering. Um, we can do spam filtering and there's additional services out there where we can actually do more aggressive filtering um, and it looks with algorithms and stuff at some of the things and verifies addresses and things before it'll even present it to your employee and things. Um, Again, patch management, um, with our monitoring and patch management, we have software, we can actually confirm whether machines have been patched, if they're updated and current, if their antivirus is updated and current, um, and things like that. But, uh, you know, if you're not doing those things, you're not rebooting machines, they're just sitting there all week in, week out, month in, month out, not being rebooted. Um, you're not doing any um, screen lock, you're not doing any password requirements on your PCs. Things. Those are all internal vulnerabilities. And again, that relates to 70% of all data breaches. Our, um, our industry leading internet security alerting solutions, consider your customer security, your custom security policies and intelligently identify suspicious anomalies, changes and threats. Actually, you're supposed to be doing this, and that's why I'm not doing it. Go for it. <laughs> as, as Nate started I don't know to what say, I'm talking about. <laughs> we do have an industry leading um, security solution that does more than just stopping uh, threats and things like that. It also looks at um, network anomalies, um, employee activity, employee um, actions, um, and their routines. Um, it may be perfectly normal for one employee to come in on Sunday afternoon, you know, they have a couple hours, they can just get work done and not have to worry about uh, being interrupted, but others don't. And if somebody did come in and sign into your network um, on Sunday afternoon, if that's suspicious, you want to know about that so that you can determine if it is an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, that employee behavior, it might not even be your employees, it could be somebody coming in from the outside world that is using your employee account. And if you can uh, be notified of those actions, um, you can take action against them and prevent uh, further attacks, um, prevent further data loss, be able to solve the problem, figure out how they got in and get it corrected before any further damage is done. Easy for you to say. <laughs> so, as we have mentioned before, training of your staff is essential. <laughs> Awareness is key to a healthy network. Um, you need to pay close attention to and don't open any sus suspicious files or attachments received from unknown sources. Do not download or install applications from untrusted sources. Don't click on any links received from unknown sources and suspicious online adverti advertisements. Create strong passwords and don't forget to change them regularly. Always install updates. Big ransomware outbreaks such as WannaCry and XPeter have shown that delays in installation of patches can take months. Ignore messages asking to disable security systems for office software or antivirus software and use proper security solution appropriate to your system type and devices. So teach your employees how to have good email hygiene. Um, 
Very important. <laughs> Watch for overly generic content and greetings. Examine the entire form, the entire email um, address. Look for urgency or demanding actions. Carefully check all of your links. Notice misspelling, incorrect grammar, and odd phrasing. Check for secure websites and don't click on any attachments right away. And in the same regard, make sure that your employees are practicing these these email hygiene tips um, and not sending out emails that look like spam. One of the biggest security threats, um, obviously, as we've talked about a lot, is employees. Um, they may do damage to your systems and your data either through incompetence, mistakes, or on purpose. Um, define what you're protecting. Um, you don't keep your hard files, uh, payroll, employee files, uh, customer documents, and things like that, and unlock cabinets in your office. Uh, why would you not lock up your electronic documents also? Um, set up folders and set access control um, with normal user identification. Uh, limit access for users to what they need, and even more, uh, even more on the remote side. If you've got people coming in remote, um, what can they see? What can they access? Um, set policies and procedures for users uh, for file storage, for file transferring. Um, have machines set to lock and have employees lock them when they walk away. Um, and this isn't just a one-time thing, this stuff we're talking about, and we've got some follow-up documentation for you. This is stuff you need to do, but this is stuff you need to continue to do. I mean, it, maybe you need to set up a quarterly review and double check stuff, work with your IT vendor, you know, verify, um, you know, that you still have these procedures and things haven't changed or somebody hasn't added some un unprotected folders and things like that. So your IT vendor should be talking to you about network health and how to protect your business and your employees. Great start to better network health is as simple, is as simple as knowledge and training. So we recommend filling out our technology checklist to see where your network is strong and where it may, may be at risk. That's something that we'll provide to you as well. Um, and then provide training for your employees and develop those policies to protect your, bus your business. Um, before we go into uh, Q&A, uh, we wanted to do our giveaway. Um, Tara has entered everyone that has attended so far. Uh, we're giving away a Logitech web camera and a web meeting light, so your face will just glow. <laughs> you want to draw? Sure. Do the honors. Let's see, it looks like... Employees are exempt. <laughs> it looks like we have Jan as our winner today. It's John. John. It's John. John. John Harrison yeah, with the sorry. incubator. <laughs> it looks like it wasn't even my hand ready. I'm a winner. Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> yeah, you spent so much time on web meetings. I'm sure you need something to take away that pasty look. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the Zoom hangover. Make yeah, it beautiful. Oh, there you go. And help your garage lighting. <laughs> Yeah. So if you have questions, please just put them in chat, uh, chat to me. Um, Tara, have you gotten any questions so far? Or? I have a bunch. And I know, okay. we, right. I know we've run and, over time. And, if, so. and yeah, we've gone way longer than what I thought we were. So if you need to drop out, we understand. Um, we will be sending out a survey, a real quick, easy one. Um, if you'll fill that out and send it back, we will email you uh, some of the handouts and things like that to go with us, like the checklist um, and some sample stuff, the red flag list and things like that. So. Um, if you need to go, appreciate it. Um, but if you have questions, please stand in line. We'll try and answer them for you. Have you seen a company with a multi-generational workforce successfully implement the use of Microsoft Teams, Slack, et cetera, to lower the use of email? Uh, fully successfully would be obviously a measure of your expectations. Um, obviously, the younger generation is more inclined to pick that stuff up more quickly than the older generations are. Um, you know, even the, the kind of middle generation, hey, middle, middle, thank you. <laughs> the, the middle generations, you know, they've not really grown up with technology, but they were exposed to it very early. Most of the time they pick it up just fine. You know, they might need a little bit extra guidance to get them going. Um, older generations, not so much. Um, a lot of times the best thing to do with older generations is encourage them to pick up the phone. Um, we all have phones in our pockets. We're all reachable all the time. So if you have an employee that's really struggling with those things, pick up the phone. It's a whole lot more difficult to impersonate a phone call than it is an email. 
So in, uh, Slack is something that we use in our office quite a bit. It really cuts down on the um, email and it helps us just stay in contact real quick and easy with everybody. Um, teams, you know, even if you're not a Teams person, you know, if you're using Zoom, some other chat features and stuff, that would be similar things, but you're taking that traffic off of email, so you're hopefully cleaning up everybody's email folders a little bit, so. How can you recover from a ransomware attack? Do you have to pay the ransom? Very carefully. <laughs> um, I actually just very recently worked with a large company here in town who will remain nameless because you will all recognize them. Um, they were hit with a ransomware attack that uh, breached their main accounting server. Um, the primary reason that it was breached was because of poor, um, poor configuration, poor uh, design, um, and also the constant pressure from management on IT to get it done, get it done yesterday and get it done cheap. Um, but we were able to fully recover um, without paying the ransomware. We had uh, online backups from the previous night. Um, they got hit at nine o'clock the next morning. They lost three hours worth of production that day. Not pleasant, not the end of the world. Um, they were up and running by five o'clock the day that the ransomware attack hit. Um, and we had you know, several days of cleanup beyond that, but no, never pay the ransom if you can possibly get away with it. By paying the ransom, you're encouraging the next ransomware attack because they were just successful. Well, and part of the reason they were able to recover was they were doing an offsite backup. And Correct. If you're not doing offsite Correct. backup, then you may not have any path to recover either. Mm -hmm. So. And I would piggyback off of that, they called you know, they work with us, they called us immediately. Yeah, they so they yeah, brought they in their did. IT partner mm -hmm. immediately. Yep. Um, if I block images from displaying on sites and in emails, will I be protected from Trixel? Tracking Pixel? Um, tracking Pixel is primarily on uh, email, what we were talking about directly related to email. Um, and by blocking the images from loading and and not clicking on the link in that email, yes, you are fully protected from that vector. Um, blocking images from websites sounds great, but it is not feasible. Um, the images not only make the website look pretty, but they also determine the layout of the website, their size, their scale, everything automatically. And there's a huge amount of information in them. I don't know anybody that blocks images in websites. Um, and also in the website, tracking pixels are not typically how you're tracked. Um, there's other other things like Google Analytics um, can be used for good. I know that our marketing department uses that. It allows you to see, you know, how effective your marketing campaigns are. It's a great tool, um, but it can also be used by the bad guys as well. Um, if you want to protect yourself on the internet browsing um, the internet, then you can use um, ad blockers and things like that and choose to block uh, um, tracking and analytics as well. Um, and that will, I hesitate to say fully protect, but that will go a long way to protecting you from those uh, tracking schemes. What should you do if you have found you have been compromised? What is the first step to take? First step to take, unplug your computer. <laughs> if, if it's a real bad compromise, just pull the power. Um, they can't do anything with your computer if it's off. Um, the second step would be to call your IT vendor. Um, whether that's us, whether that's one of our competitors, whether you have your own internal staff, call somebody immediately. Um, it's one of those things, the sooner they know about it, the sooner they can get somebody over there and the sooner they can start to analyze the damage and correct and recover as necessary. How does a company stay ahead of all of the attacks that are occurring and be prepared for any new attacks? Unfortunately, this is a little bit of a loaded question. You cannot stay ahead. Um, security in general is very much reactive. Um, and that's not just uh, computer security, it's physical security as well. The reason that there's a new safe model that comes out every year is because last year's model got breached. Somebody figured out how to open that lock without the key. Um, and that's very much the same in the IT world. Um, to stay as far ahead as you can, um, practice good employee training. There again, stuck record. But, you know, employees are key. You know, we need them to run our business. We need the technology to work for them. But they, they also can let uh, bad people in. Um, second would be run your patches. Um, if you have an IT vendor that does manage patching, that's huge. 
um, because it takes the patching out of your user's hands and your IT vendor can make sure that you're always up to date. Third would be to have a business grade email that you get alerts on. Um, and there again, that's key. If you know employees see a little pop up in the corner that says, you know, AVG antivirus, we found this, what do you want to do? Ignore. It's way too easy just to just to kick that can down the road. But if your IT vendor gets an alert, they'll create a ticket, they'll get it taken care of. A lot of times, um, all you'll get is an email, hey, we saw this alert, the system took care of it, you're good to go. Um, but a lot of times other actions will be necessary, um, either you know, shutting down that computer until somebody can come out, um, or you know, any, any number of things, it depends on the scenario, but um, those, those three things right there are key. Can I exclude trusted sites from being blocked? Um, typically, yes, you can. Um, trusted sites are, there, well, there's two kinds of trusted sites. There's actually a trusted site list in your computer that reduces the security measures. That's for old legacy sites um, that don't work well with the modern computers. But with your um, web content filtering, you can absolutely add a list of sites. You know, um, I'm drawing a blank on an example, but uh, say Granger, if you're a manufacturing company, I need to let my employees get to Granger all the time. Absolutely, you can make a list, you know, whether it's three sites or 300 sites long, you can input that into a white list and those sites will be safe. Um, most of the time though, we don't see any issues with that because the databases are constantly updated and not by us, by teams of people that, uh, that do exclusively that. Most of the time the web content filtering is, uh, is very good. What is the best way for a company to educate their staff? Where can a company go to get help with training? Um, that's, that's a very good question. There's, <laughs> yeah, there's, 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you, I mean, first of all, you need to be engaged with an IT vendor. Um, you know, you need to look at what you're doing, confirm, you know, review how you're set up, how your network's set up, how your files are storage and archive and security measures that you have, um, and things. Some of what we'll provide after this, we'll have some checklists and some worksheets for you to work with, maybe some sample uh, policies that you can work with. Um, the, the big thing is, unfortunately, like we keep saying, it comes down to employees. So you've got to educate the employees and you need to keep them up to date um, and things. ComWest um, can help you with that. Um, if you have a relationship with another IT vendor, they should be able to help you with that um, and things. But uh, yeah, it, it's a constant ongoing thing. This is not a one and done. Um, you know, you spend a little time, maybe spend a few bucks today and then you don't worry about it for another five years. Uh, that ain't going to work. You got to be uh, constantly working on this. Yeah, and the the IT checklist that we'll send out, I think that's a great place to start. Um, just seeing all those, what you're doing well, what may need help, um, and then you can contact your vendor. Um, you can contact ComWest or you can contact someone else um, and just get an idea of where you may be lacking and how they can help you. I think part of it comes down to being a culture of cybersecurity too and that you know having that a focus of what your team does mm -hmm. you know yep, making absolutely. that part of your business instead of an afterthought yeah and if you're actively doing the monitoring um some network tools and things like that you're taking a big step to it but you still have to engage with your employees you can't just um uh, just it's uh, technology tools are, are is not going to fix all this I mean, we can, Thomas can deploy all this stuff and things, but if your employee gets an email that says, hey, you need to reset your password on this, and you click that link, and then you plug in your password, and you know they just gave their password off to somebody else for the bank or something like that. I mean, technology can't stop that. There, there is a big human factor in this, and it's just something people need to be aware of. And, and uh, we would be more than happy, like was said, to help you with that. Um, you know, schedule a lunch meeting with your office, have one of us come by. Um, we will obviously talk to you ahead of time, come up with a, a customized list of what you want to enforce, um, have a slice of pizza with you and, you know, <laughs> have it be less formal and more of just, just a conversation rather than, rather than, you know, sitting in a formal classroom, taking notes, preparing for the test at the end. You know, nobody likes that, but if it, if you can make it less formal, make it something you know, I hesitate to say fun. Nobody really likes company <laughs> meetings. But if you can take that formality out of it, um, that goes a long way as well.
Is it necessary to have a VPN even if I have security software? What is the benefit of a VPN? There again, that's a little bit of a loaded question. Um, there are two types of VPNs. Um, there's the VPN like uh, NordVPN and several of the other ones that you see uh, TV commercials for, that you hear radio adverts for. Um, those are uh, geared towards home environments and those are not to protect your computer and your data. Those are to hide your location. Um, and that's not so much what we're going for. Um, the VPNs that we're referring to are to allow you to securely from another location, be that your home, um, a, a customer's facility, if you need to get back into the office, but they, they allow you from a lo remote location to come into the office to access your internal files. Um, those are, mostly required depending on what it is that you have in place if you're using cloud applications for everything that's the exception you don't need that but if you're trying to get into your computer at the office then you do need some sort of a secure connection a vpn virtual private network to do that securely and correctly even if you're doing a remote desktop uh, you want to yep. come in through a vpn yep so um last question unless there's more please chat me um, if a site asks me to allow notifications, should I click deny on all of them, even if it tells me it's required to view the site? Um, generally speaking, you should deny them. Um, if, if the person that asked this question is referring to what I think that they're referring to, um, in Google Chrome, websites can push you notifications so that they can send you information even when you're not on that website. There is absolutely no reason to allow that. Um, all they do is nag at you. Um, I know one of the people sitting on this call has had multiple reports of uh, somebody that he works very closely with getting lots of those notifications. Um, and those can always be safely denied. And again, in Google Chrome, I think that's what we're referring to here. You can actually turn that off so that the sites can't even prompt you for those. Those are all the questions I have. Cool. Well, thank you guys. It definitely went longer than what we thought, but it, like I said, it's a lot of material. Um, as you've picked up, ComWest is an office technology company. Um, we do these things for your business so that you can focus on the things that you do best, which is run your business. Um, if you don't have a technology partner or trying to do these things yourself, give us a call. Um, we'll meet with you, review your situation, talk about how you can grow your business with the proper technology support and be safe. Um, thank you for taking the time today. I know everybody, like I started with, everybody just need one more Zoom meeting to do. Um, preach it, please reach out to us if you have any questions.